So as Dr. Shikande mentioned, I work in the Alford lab. So the Alford lab is a cell biology lab where we study cilia using this um, Chlamydomonas reinhardi, which is a species of green algae. So currently in the lab, our focus is this protein called FAP93. So today I'll be talking to you guys about my research project on what mechanism of assembly FAP93 uses to assemble. So what are cilia and flagella? So the terms cilia and flagella are used interchangeably. And what they are is this highly conserved organelle, essentially a structure on the cell, much like that of the nucleus or the mitochondria. Um, and there are two types of cilia. So there are motile and non-motile cilia. The motile cilia play a role in motility and then fluid flow, whereas non-motile cilia play a role in a sensory function. So attached here on the slide are just various examples of cilia. So first here, I have a little schematic of the Chlamydomonas, um, where the two black lines here are showing the cilia. Oh, my mouse is weird. Um, and then this anemone looking thing is actually the cilia in your airways. So interestingly, and then we also have this frog embryo here, which I personally really love this image. Um, all these green specks right here are actually cilia. And then lastly, in the bottom left here, kind of have like the classic textbook definition where this green cell right here as cilia sprouting out from the top. So cilia are found almost everywhere in various different organisms, but the reason why we get funded is because cilia are very prominent in human health. So a really big example is the sperm tail. So the cilium here allows the sperm to travel to the egg for fertilization. Um, and then again, we have respiratory cilia that clear the debris from your airways. And then there's even cilia in your brain. Um, they're called ependymal cilia, and they actually move the cerebral spinal fluid in your brain. So as you might imagine, defects in cilia can lead to a very uh, wider range of diseases, and this could be due to proper or improper assembly of the cilia, or they just might not be moving like they normally would. And we collectively term these diseases ciliopathies. So the corresponding ciliopathies to the previously mentioned examples would be infertility, respiratory infections, and then hydrocephalus. So this highly conserved organelle is super um, structured and um, it's much like that of a cucumber actually. So if you were to take a cucumber anywhere along its length and chop it, you would see that same structure that you see when you're um, chopping your cucumber. And the same is true about the cilium. So in this image here, we have the cell here um, and then the cilium is protruding out like an antenna. And if you were to chop the cilium anywhere along its length, you would see this um, structure right here called the nine plus two structure, um, which is a little easier to see here in the schematic. So the structure is um, the two comes from the two central um, pair right here of microtubules. And then there are nine outer doublet microtubules here. And this is all enclosed in a flagellar membrane. So in addition to this structure, um, if you were to take that same cilium and lay it on its side, there's a repeating set of proteins that occur every 96 nanometers. So what this looks like is essentially like a molecular ruler. So every 96 nanometers, there's this repeating set of proteins. For example, if you look at this like Y-shaped protein kind of in purple gray, um, it occurs at this one inch mark here on the ruler. And if you look at the next ruler, we see the same Y-shaped protein again. And crazy about this is actually that all of these proteins are actually assembled in the cell body, and then they have to be transported to the tip of the cilium to be assembled. So the way the cell does this is through this mechanism called interflagellar transport. So interflagellar transport, also called IFT, is the bidirectional transport of particles in the cilium. So to orient you on this figure, it's essentially if we took that cucumber from before and we cut it in half vertically. So this would be your cucumber in half vertical. So the outside here would be the membrane, the green bars here in the middle are that central pair, the gray bars are that the doublet microtubules that I mentioned where there were nine of them. So how this works is that there are kinesin motors, which are shown in blue. Um, and those are responsible for the base or from the cilium at the cell to the tip of the cilium. And then there are dynein motors that are shown in purple and they're responsible for the movement from the tip back to the cell body. So how this works if more specifically is that these motors bind to an IFT particle that are shown in pink. And then the IFT particle can bind to different cargos, which are shown by the various colored diamonds. 
And you'll also notice that they're carrying the other motor. So they carry the other motor up to the top to be used on the way back down. So an analogy for this is actually snowboarding. <laughs> so if you think of your kinesin motors as snowshoes, um, your dyne motors would be a snowboard and the IFT particle would be you. And in this case, your cargo is gonna be hot chocolate. So if we were to look over here at the figure, the doublet microtubules would be your mountain. So you as the IFT particle would bind to your snowshoes so that you can travel and you're gonna hold on to your cargo, which will be your hot chocolate. And of course you wanna bring your snowboard so you don't have to walk back down. So you walk up along your doublet microtubules here to the top and you give the nice man who's working the ski lift a cup of hot chocolate. And then you switch from your snowshoes to your snowboard to go back down. And of course you don't wanna buy another pair of snowshoes. So you bring them back down too. Okay. So just to um, get back to the project, um, the lab goal here is to understand the role of that protein FAF93. So this protein is actually not along the whole length of the axoneme. It's actually just located at like the base of the cilia, like right when they start. So we're curious about this protein's function. So one way which I'll be talking about is the assembly of this protein. And then another way Courtney Stewart covered in her talk yesterday, which is analyzing the length of that um, FAF93 domain or region. So my research question here is what mechanism does FAF93 utilize to assemble? And I hypothesize that it's using that intraflagellar transport mechanism to assemble. So to do this, I'm using the model organism Clamidomonas, lovingly called Clammy. Um, so Clammy is a great model organism for this, one, because it's a single cell organism, which in this top um, image here, you see the single cell. And then these two are its um, cilia, which it uses to swim like in a breast um, brushstroke type way. And then it also grows up really fast in the lab, so it makes it very doable to balance in, with classes. So on the right here is our cells actually in cousins. So these are different plates of cell types that we have. And then you might see these like flasks bubbling in the windows, and that's when we're going to do an experiment with these. So particularly for my project, it's important to note that clammy has two different mating types. Um, the cells are also haploid, so meaning they only have one set of genes, unlike humans, which have two. And because they only have one set of genes, it's really easy to make mutants with these cells. So one particular one is a conditional mutant that I'm using, and it's called FLA10. So FLA10 is a temperature sensitive mutant. So meaning at a room temperature, it's normal, but when you turn up the heat, he's not the same. He's, a, he's actually defective in that kinesin motor that I mentioned with the IFT which would be that snowshoes in the analogy. So he can't climb up the mountain to the top. So to answer my research question, I'm using this technique that's specific to Clamidomonas, which is dicarion rescue. Um, so in this case, you would have two cell types. Um, we have wild type here, and you'll see that there's green here at the base of the cilium. And this is to show the FAF93 region. And then in this mutant here, there's no FAF93, which is shown by the lack of green. So what happens is you have two mating types. In this case, we call them plus and minus, and you starve them of nitrogen to encourage them to mate. So once you mix these two cells, they actually form this large dicarion cell, is what we call them, that has like the cytoplasm, the nucleus, and the cilia from both of the cells. And so the theory is here is that essentially the FAF93 here will be sharing with this cilia, and that's why we would see um, the FAF93 rescued on the other two cilia. And then just for fun, this is actually a video of clammy mating in the lab. So what you'll see is that they form these clusters right here. And this is them trying to mate. You'll kind of see some swimming around in the background. My personal favorite's up here in the top left, this guy swimming in a circle. <laughs> so just to reiterate, my um, research question is how does this protein assemble? And I think it's using IFT. So to answer this, I perform a dicarion rescue with that temperature sensitive mutant FLA10 and a double mutant of FAP93 and FLA10. And then I confirm this result by using immunofluorescence. So in the top right here of the screen is the cell types that I'm using and an immunofluorescence image. So on the left here is the FLA10. You see the length of the cilia here in red and the FAP93 protein is shown in green. And then you'll see with our double mutant, the length of the cilia here, but there is no FAP93 protein. So in this um, technique, we are going to form a dicarion 
And at the room temperature, we hopefully will see this happy dicarion with daphnine 3 and all four cilia. So a little bit more details on these mutants, because I know they're confusing. So flaw 10, temperature sensitive. So um, it's defective in the kinesin protein that was the motor to go from the cell body to the tip, meaning that at permissive or 21 degrees, which is about room temperature, it's perfectly fine. It works. The IFT is working fine. But at the restrictive temperature, it has defective IT, IFT, meaning like it doesn't have the snowshoes if you refer back to the um, snowboarding analogy. And then the same rationale for the double mutant, except for it's deficient in the FAP93 protein. So what this allows us to do is to observe the dicarions when IFT is on and off to see if they can recover the FAP93 protein in the double mutant cells. So here's a schematic of what this pro, um, the predictions of this experiment will are, sorry. So top here are the two cells that we're using. And on the left here is when we mate the cells at um, the permissive temperature when I of T is on. So we expect to see FAP93 on all four cilia, which would indicate that FAP93 can be rescued using this mechanism or technique, sorry. And then on the right here, um, when we mate the cells at the restrictive temperature when I of T is off, we expect to see one of two results, either in B, or we see FAP93 on all the cilia. This would indicate that IFT is not required since IFT is off in this case. Or we might see C, where we only see FAP93 on two of the cilia, which would indicate that we need that IFT to assemble the FAP93. So here's the immunofluorescence data from this experiment. Um, this one right here is from the permissive temperature when IFT is on. So on the left here, this is showing you the length of the cilia, and this is the dicarion cell here with the four flagella. This one's kind of out of plane, but you can see the tip of it here and the other two there. The middle panel here is showing the FAP93 protein in green, which you see these two strong, bigger spots here, and there's a smaller one here, and kind of one there in the middle. And then this, lastly, this image is merged together. So this results indicate that um, we can use this technique to rescue FAP93, and also we can make a dicarion out of these cells, which is important. Um, something interesting to note, though, was that there are these two larger FAP93 stains, and then the other ones were not as big. So this was kind of interesting, and we kind of termed it partial rescue instead of full rescue. And then similarly, when we mated these cells at the restrictive temperature, we had formation of the dicarion here, and we also saw the same result where we have four FAP93 stains. However, two of them were not as big as the others, indicating that same partial rescue. So what this result meant was that FAP93 is not utilizing IFT to assemble, and the presence of the IFT didn't affect how much of the protein was recovering. So upon further analysis, um, this graph here shows the dicarions at the 21 degrees when IFT is on and the 32 when IFT is off, and then length here on the y-axis. So the black bars are showing the ciliary length of the dicarions. The gray is that bigger FAP93 region, and then the white is the smaller FAP93 region. Essentially, what this data showed was that there is no difference between the dicarions at the 21 degrees or 32 degrees, meaning that IFT had no effect on the amount of recovery. Um, and it was also really interesting to see that the FAP93 region and like the rescue region were significantly different at both 21 and 32 degrees. So in summary, I hope that you guys see that cilia are essential organelles after watching similar presentations about cilia twice maybe. Also, we find Clamidomonas very cute. So I hope that you guys kind of see why we find them cute now. And then in addition, my research suggested that this protein does not use IFT to assemble. And it was really interesting that the IFT presence did not influence how much was recovering. So this kind of begs us some more questions about why is that happening? And like, is it possible to achieve full rescue? So special thanks to my honor chair, Dr. Alford here in the top left. Um, and then my committee members, Dr. Schmeichel, Dr. Sale, and Dr. Vaughn. And then a special shout out to Kara Jones for getting me to apply with, to work with Dr. Alford. And then Courtney Stewart, who was also an honor student who worked with me in the lab. 
And then lastly, Ariana, who used to work with us in the lab, it's been a really great peer mentor for me.